Cool. All right. So, hey, everybody. Uh, this is Ed Friedman. Uh, I uh, chair of Friends of Mary Meaning Bay. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, for those of you that don't know, we're going to run through a little bit of intro here on a few slides, and then I'll introduce our speaker tonight and hand the screen over to him. Um, I do want to thank uh, Martha Spies, who's in the background, being our tech person on this, and uh, her husband, Arthur, if he comes home, will be helping as well. Um, if you have questions, if you could put them in the chat box, which you can access from a little Zoom toolbar, and then um, Martha will kind of curate those at the end, and, and Nate will have an opportunity to answer them. Um, so I think that's what I want to say there. Without further ado, we'll kind of stream through some of these um, pictures here. So yeah, we're a, you know we're a unique uh, organization, one of the few that takes a holistic approach to the environment. And so we're we're doing a bunch of research. A lot of it's cutting edged. Um, and we do some advocacy work. We do education, and we are a land trust. So these are just a few slides for some examples. Um, and yeah, multi-year circulation study of the bay, which was really illuminating. You can see it on our website in animated form. You can read about it, do a bunch of archaeology, tie that often to uh, land that we've protected, uh, looking at toxics issues a lot over the years. And so we did a lot with cage mussels <clears throat> for biomonitoring, detecting where PCB hotspots were in the Kennebec, whether or not mills are discharging dioxin. And so we, we try and inform our... Uh, Still not moving ahead here. There we go. Um, we use our research to inform our advocacy. And um, a lot of that revolves around a um, topic we'll be touching on tonight, fish passage, um, moving fish up and down the rivers of Maine, which I always equate to arteries. Um, a lot of work with toxics over the years, as I said. Um, and sort of just getting into looking at PFAS chemicals, the forever chemicals, or everywhere forever chemicals now and um, about to do a side-by-side -side, um, comparison next week with four different labs actually next Ed. anyway moving right along <laughs> um, reach a lot of students over the years uh, that's uh, covid's put a little bit of a crimp in our in our style there but we still managed to get into a few, couple of schools last year and get them outside and be doing some great uh, education stuff. And, and this series is part of our program as well. And protected a lot of land over the years, probably 1500 acres by now, working on three, three easements uh, at the moment. And our focus is on valuable wildlife habitat as opposed to uh, recreational trails of which there are plenty with other groups around the Bay. If you like the program tonight or want to see any other programs that we've had, um, we do record them. And if you go to the home page of our website down on the right column under education, you'll see speaker series video um, um, list and archives there. And I think um, you know Martin McDonough is our general web volunteer for, for putting this stuff up there. And then we have another web volunteer working on our library, the electronic library. Um, and that's um, uh, Stan and he, if you haven't been to the cyber, it's a wonderful resource and I encourage you to go there. So we're almost at the end of the season here. It's our 25th season and uh, here right now and next month, I'd encourage you to join us for a special presentation of to be or not to be about pollinators and threats to pollinators. And that will be great. So tonight's uh, program, here we are, I'll introduce Nate known for many years. Nate's a project leader on, on, on the, you know, with DMR in, the, in their Kennebec Hydropower Developers Group, um, Bureau of Sea Run Fisheries and Habitat. He's also on our board, full disclosure. Uh, Nate's worked extensively on the Kennebec and its tributaries since 1992. He's been involved in virtually all aspects of the restoration program. Um, he and many of us on the call uh, watched Edwards Dam come down in 1999 which was the first working hydro dam to be dismantled. Um, Nate's in the population of river herrings, which are alewives and uh, blueback herring combined, uh, rise from sort of a paltry 100,000 to over 3 million 
with installation of multiple fish passages and the opening of thousands of acres of historical habitat in the Kennebec drainage. Uh, he's worked extensively on uh, shad restoration in the Kennebec River and was actively involved in the Wallowboro shad hatchery uh, from 1992 to 2007. So that's pretty much it for that. Remember to join us next uh, month on the second Wednesday of the month and we'll go from there and I'll hand the screen over to Nate or someone else already worked on doing that, looks like. Good evening, folks. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm seeing lots of lots of faces instead of just you here, but maybe that's yeah, that, that's that's good. Uh, I'll I'll share a screen here in a second. Uh, okay. I just wanted to give you some FaceTime with me. Um, as I indicated, uh, May eighth will mark my thirtieth uh, year. Uh, on my thirty first, actually, I will have completed thirty years in the department. And uh, let's jump right into it. Can you guys see my stuff okay? Not sharing yet. Not sharing yet. Okay, let's let's try that again. All right. I'm gonna do this the where is it? Give me a second here. Okay. All right. Slideshow, then start from current slide. Yeah. Am I up? No. Nope. Not yet. Okay. Hold on. You may, need to, you may need to do what I did, Nate, and stop sharing and then come back into your. Window. There we go. Yep. Yep. Oh. Perfect. All right. And then. From the beginning. All right, here we go. That's working, thanks. All right, we're up and running. Uh, when I first started thinking about this, you know, we, we put in the speaker series together and, and Ed asked me to do something on Shad. And what I soon discovered was it's hard to talk just about one and not recognize the other, uh, specifically when we talk about ecology. Uh, this simple cover slide uh, just shows the three species, uh, the shad being on the top, bale life in the middle, blueback herring on the bottom. Respectively, they're close to the correct size. Uh, shad, we use an average of about three or four pounds in the main stem Kennebec. Uh, they get significantly larger than that. Uh, they can get all the way up to 10 plus pounds. They can live an extraordinarily long time. Uh, as far as anadromous fish go, a very long time. They've been uh, documented up to 13 years old. Uh, typically speaking, shad are sexually mature as five-year-olds. The middle fish is the alewife, very, very similar. Uh, has a different uh, breeding habit of, besides the shad. It doesn't breed in... in uh, big river sections, although it will if it can't get to go where it needs to go. They're typically a pond-based fish for spawning. The blueback herring is very similar to the shad. Uh, it spawns in rivers, uh, but unlike the shad, its eggs are adhesive, and they will stick to the substrate and subsequently hatch out. Shad eggs will hatch out as they drift downstream. And we're just gonna slowly kick through here. We got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, this is a very big topic and I hope I do it justice for you. American shad distribution. This is a map showing North America, of course. Uh, the Eastern seaboard, you can see kind of has that green fuzzy shading on it. That was the historical extent of shad up until about the mid 19th century when we actually, once the transcontinental railroad was put through, Somebody magically shipped some shad eggs, some fertilized shad eggs, transcontinental all the way over to the West Coast, put them in, and they took hold. Which is rather remarkable, and I'll explain to you why, because shad are not an easy fish to work with. Uh, in fact, just messing with them for the simplest of studies usually will blow the study all to pieces. Tagging a shad will cause the shad to run away. You'll never see it again. Uh, 
different methodologies of tagging, either cause the fish to run away or kill it outright. Uh, they are a very leery fish, and once they get frightened, they do not behave normally, uh, which is very interesting to think about it, it, in regards to things like fish passage, where you want to study the animal that you're trying to affect fish passage for, and every time you do something regarding the study to track the fish, the fish runs away immediately. And sometimes so far away, you never find it again. So that's the historical extent of shad uh, on the Eastern seaboard. We're not gonna talk about the Western populations. Here's the river herring one, and this one's pretty interesting. They, they cover pretty much the same territory. I will tell you that what this map, these maps do not show uh, are the Canadian Maritimes where many of these populations extend well up into the Canadian Maritimes. But it does show the America that we know on the East Coast and the alewife don't extend quite as far south down into Georgia. The blueback herring extend well down into Florida. Uh, if we were to look at these colored swaths as the volume of fish, and we use the ones that are up there now as the historical volume. If we were to put up the current volume, you'd see a couple tiny small spots of pink for alewife and a couple tiny small spots of blue for a blueback herring because we have reduced these populations, collectively river herring, by about 96% from their historical abundance. And we'll get into that a little bit further down the pike. This slide is busy, but it kind of has to be. And it shows essentially the rivers that we know historically had shad populations and what's available now for miles or uh, kilometers of habitat. But the slide is deceiving. Remember what I told you about fish passages, simply because there's a fish passage doesn't necessarily mean that the shad is going to use it. In fact, shad are very leery about fish passages. They tend to use fish lifts better than they use uh, volitional passages like denials or, or vertical slots. And they, they tend to be very shy of fish passages and they don't like going in them. They don't like dramatic changes in lighting that usually occur around the entrances of fish passages. Uh, they're very, very difficult fish to deal with when it comes to restoration. So we have about 1,622 river kilometers available across those 23 river systems of the 2,587 kilometers that we think were historically accessible. And our shad population is coming back somewhat, but not without a load of work to do it. Historically, the shad population in the Kennebec River uh, was robust. It fed people for literally thousands upon thousands of years. And of course, the Industrial Revolution comes on and we start building dams and cut off access to historical habitat and the population begins to decline, yet we continue to fish on the resource. In fact, the poundage that came out of the Kennebec was still significantly robust but it was declining, but we were getting a million pounds, 800,000 pounds, well up into the 1900s. And then another thing started to happen on these rivers. And we turned them from sites of industry to sites of industry and effluent. And we slowly poisoned the river. And that made it even tougher yet. And the population then began to plummet precipitously. And we'll get to a graph that shows that. I have to put up the typical life cycle. This is a typical river herring, uh, anadromous fish life cycle. Uh, basically, the adults come in, in this case in May and June, they swim upstream. Uh, the alewives will head to the ponds, the blueback herring and the shad will stay in the main stem rivers, the tertiary rivers, and they'll begin spawning literally a little bit later than the alewives do, but not much, they overlap by quite a bit. The alewives will swim up into the ponds, they'll start spawning. Um, they'll release females, typically 100,000 eggs. 
Uh, blueback herring, close to that number. The older the fish is, unlike the Pacific salmon that we're all used to seeing dying post spawn, these fish don't. Some do, but the, the bulk of them live and survive to spawn another year. That's kind of a tongue in cheek statement. If I were to put this out as a percentage, you know, a female alewife carries 100,000 eggs and she spawns all of those eggs. The number of fish that return from that effort of 100,000 eggs on a stable population is about two. Survival, therefore, is 0 0.00002. The replacement rate, one male, one female. It gives you some understanding of the epic gauntlet that these fish run. Blueback herring, very similar. American shad, the further north you go, the more likely it is that they will sur survive a spawning event. They don't release near as many eggs in the northern tier of their range that their southern brethren do. Typically speaking, in the southern rivers, the shad, after they spawn, will die. But they release many more gametes into the, into the cycle than the northern ones do. do. So an average size shad up here in Maine might release 300,000 eggs versus one further down south that might release 600,000 eggs, but die as a result of that effort. The resultant eggs hatch out and the larvae swim around in the river system. And it's very interesting when you, and I'll show you a picture of a shad larvae and it pretty much covers the basis for the alewife and blueback herring larvae as well. This is a very, very small animal. In fact, it's so small, we refer to it as ichthyoplankton. If you were to have one in a glass of water, it's doubtful unless the glass was extraordinarily clean that you would even notice it was in there. That's how small they are, roughly about a centimeter long, 12 millimeters, very, very small. That fish, when it's born in the river, doesn't have the strength to stay where it is. So it just kind of drifts down with the current and it's eating the whole time. They have to get on feed right away. They have to, they start eating zooplankton. They start eating diatoms. They start eating what they need to eat to, to grow up to be big, strong shad or bluebacks. And in the freshwater ponds, the same thing with the alewives. They have to start eating right away or it's all over. And in the case of the shad, they'll drift down, drift down, drift down. And slowly as they get bigger and bigger, and that takes about a month to five weeks, we call it metamorphosis, where it goes from being this tiny thread with eyeballs to something that starts looking like the adult form. In fact, almost exactly like it, except for extremely shrunken down. Then a behavioral change takes place and it goes from being kind of a, a passive drift downstream <coughs> excuse me, to an active hunter. And now it's looking for a good place to hang out and they'll find these pocket waters, these eddies along the bank. And they'll lay in those eddies and wait for bits of zooplankton to drift by and dart out. And we've identified several of them in the upper reaches of the Kennebec post Edwards Dam removal that these fish will utilize and hold on. And they can grow much bigger, much faster, and they kind of have a protected area to feed out of until something else comes along and finds them. Eventually, they're big enough, the fall starts coming, water temperatures begin to decline, photo period declines, production declines, triggers a response in the fish, it starts backing out toward the estuary. Typically the estuary maintains higher production because of its unique saltwater, freshwater mix. And the zooplankton can get a little bit bigger and the fish start feeding readily there, getting bigger and bigger all the time, getting deeper and deeper into fall, the temperature continues to plummet. The, now we're getting down to the shortest days of the year and the fish will completely drop out of the estuary and into the Gulf of Maine. And typically they'll start drifting southward. What we've found in our, in our trawl survey offshore, uh, New Hampshire and Maine uh, do some combined trawl survey work. And we're seeing those fish somewhere between the Kennebec and the Saco. And we're seeing an abundance of two-year-olds not many three-year-olds, we're not sure why. And I'm just gonna, in full disclosure here, we know a lot about shad 
but that only fills a few pages. The part that we don't know fills volumes. You're not exactly sure where they go. And remember, I told you about the tagging bit. Hard to tag one of these things and have it behave anywhere near normal or not die outright. So they go out to sea for four or five years in the case of shad. They become sexually mature. They swim back in and we start the cycle all over again. This is that graph I kind of referred to. These are commercial shad and river herring landings from the National Marine Fisheries Service. And I think you get the idea of the trend here. Okay, we went from American shad landings in millions of pounds, river herring landings in the millions of pounds, and that lasted into the 60s, and all of a sudden it started to tank, go down pretty hard, and then it started to tank some more, and then it absolutely collapsed. A lot of questions on why it hung on as long as it did. And there's some speculation there, and I don't think it's far off the mark, because you got to remember, these weren't the only things we were fishing for. We fished for a lot of things. And a lot of the things we fish for like eating these things. And so we're taking some of that pressure away. We're removing some of that natural F or mortality from the system and changing it over to a human-driven form of mortality, i.e. commercial fishing. So the cod stocks, the near cod stocks, we rubbed those out first. Obviously, the near shore cod stocks were the easiest to target because you didn't have to go out to Grand Banks and risk your neck to get them. They were right in close to these river mouths, and there's a reason for that. They're waiting. They're waiting for the machine to run. They're waiting for the adults to come in. When the adults are coming in, the river herring and the American shad are pre-staging down near the estuary at the mouth of these rivers. The cod have just spawned in March. They're extremely hungry and tired and maybe just a little bit cold and they go after them. Just like we went after the cod because we knew they were there. There's a, too much correlation between where these near shore cod stocks were hanging out in these big river herring rivers and American shad rivers to not make the connection that the reason they're hanging out there isn't for the good weather. They're hanging out there for the food. So part of the speculation is, is that the catches remained as high as they did until we really managed to whack those cod and haddock stocks to the point where they weren't really impacting recruitment on a yearly basis of the river herring stocks and the American shad stocks. When I first started working with the department, we started hauling fish. This is a picture of an interior of a hatchery. And you can see that there's adult American shad in the tank. Now we started doing this, but prior to doing that, we just hauled adults back from the Holyoke River in Connecticut. Get in the stocking truck at 3.34 a.m. in the morning, drive five and a half hours down to Holyoke. The stocking truck is not fast. It's very big, very heavy, two tanks, 16,000 pounds of water. We'd load the fish up into the truck from the fishway, which was no small feat. We had to run around in hard hats and flotation vests and chest waders. We had to actually get into the trap with the fish, bail them out of the trap, a false bottom trap that came up from the bottom of the fishway, and bail them out of the trap, put them in a one cubic meter tote, roll them across the top of the deck of the dam, hook them to a hoist, lower them down 30 feet to the truck bed down below where we would dip them out and put them first in the forward tank, then in the rear tank, 75 fish each, close the hatch, get in the truck, drive five and a half hours back to either the Andro or the Kennebec River in Sydney, undo the hatches, let the fish go. Typically speaking, early on, we killed 30% of every load, which is tough to take because you only had 175 to begin with. What we started to see, the resulting falls, those fish, even though they were not in the Connecticut River, they did spawn. We detected good numbers of American Shard Juvenile dropping out through Edwards Dam prior to its removal. But what we soon came to realize is this is a slow boat. It's hard to generate enough signal to really put a, a, a good jump on the shad population, which we knew still existed at least in its vestigial form below Edwards Dam because we could see them. 
You can see them while we were working at Edwards. It also happened to be the broodstock site for our river herring recovery program on the upper Kennebec and the Sebastocook. We could see those fish swimming around. We could see shoals of shad. But when I say shoal, these are very small shoals. How many fish were there? I cannot answer that, but there were some. Enough to be noticeable. And on a similar note, river herring wise, on a good year, we could manage to get about 100 fish, 100,000 fish. And we'd suck them up literally with a giant pump out of the river, dump them in a tank, sort them out, put them in the stocking truck once again, and drive like the Dickens as far as we had to drive whichever pond we were hitting, be it Sebastopol Lake or Unity Pond or West Aruncet Lake or Pleasant Pond or Plymouth Pond or Lovejoy Pond or Patty Pond and dump them in, turn around and do it all again. It was typically seven days a week, 10 to 14 hours a day, depending on how many fish we got, roughly for about six weeks. In the case of the shad hatchery, what we figured out was, well, let's try putting them in a tank. And then we did a whole bunch of reading, and you're going to meet a fella here who was very responsible. It's mentioned in the, in the, in the uh, brief for this, for this speaker series, a fellow by the name of Sam, Sam Chapman. And what they were doing down south, because there was other, other stations that were doing this uh, in College PA uh, uh, on the Susquehanna, they were using gonadotropin and they were injecting the fish with gonadotropin to stimulate gamete production. And we did that basically with a very large hypodermic needle. And we'd forcibly hold the fish down with a big wet towel over it and stick it in the side and put a big pellet of gonadotropin in it. The females, the males we didn't have to do that to, we're all pretty much the same. Females, we had to stimulate egg production. And it did stimulate egg production, but what we found was that about half the eggs, when it varied from fish to fish and from day to day and from year to year, we only did this a couple of years, half the eggs weren't even viable. They come out and they were premature because the eggs were very, 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 in an organized way on the skein, the ones closest up, uh, the blood supply mature first, and then the next ones move up and those ones mature. And that tells you something how the shad spawn. It doesn't spawn 3,000 eggs at once, it spawns, or 300,000 eggs at once, it spawns, you know, 1,500 in an evening. And they're nighttime spawners or very, very overcast day spawners. And they'll spawn in mid water column, a bunch of males chasing around a bunch of females. So we started trying that in the shad hatchery. And we take the females and females and we put them in these big tanks and we'd put on the mood lighting and the sun would go down and it would get dark and they would start to spawn. And it worked. And you didn't have to use gonadotropin. You didn't have to do anything that was deleterious to the lifespan of the shad. In fact, by the end of this, and I'll get to it because this slide is really boring, um, we were producing great gobs of shad, larval shad. And since we're on the topic, here's one now, okay? And I'm just gonna tell you, that's magnified a whole bunch, okay? Just so you can get an idea of what we're talking about here. But if you were to hold your fingers about this far apart, that's how big that thing is. A little thread with eyeballs. We took some of those revolt, you know, resulting shad larvae and put them in these rearing ponds immediately adjacent to the hatchery to raise fingerlings, fall fingerlings, basically the adult form of shad, only very small, maybe that big, 10 centimeters or so, 100 millimeters. Those shad ponds were quite large. We had to build a custom net to sane them out and what we found with that particular exercise was it worked, but it was very tough on the fish. Uh, in order to sain the pond, it took about 15 people. That's no lie. Then you had to, you know, have basically a fire brigade going that haul the fish out of the net by the bucket full because you couldn't dry net them because it would knock all the scales off and then they would die. Put them in the truck and then drive and then dump them out and you'd still lose a whole bunch of the fall fringlings, which was kind of depressing. So we moved on to stocking shad larvae. In the larval stage, they're actually far more robust than you would give them credit for being as small as they are, but they, unlike the adult form and the fingerling stage, they don't die when you look at them funny. 
they're quite robust when you haul them in water. So we actually began hauling larval shad to the stocking sites. Just to give you an idea of the distances we covered, this, these aren't covering roads, these are just as the crow flies. It would take about five hours to make Walt, to make Holyoke from, from uh, Hallowell, Maine with the stocking truck. What we found after we started killing 30% of our loads every time, working with the shad hatchery, we came up with basically a solution that we would put in the tank, which consisted of things like rock salt and, and, uh, and several other salts that are commercially available. We carefully did the calculations on what we needed for a percent salt solution. We basically made what amounted to Gatorade for shad. The shad, when you put them in the non-Gatorade solution, would sweat just like a human was is when it's nervous. And they would literally lose fluid so fast that they would go into shock by the time you got them home. By making this solution, the salt solution, it kind of tricked the shad into holding its fluids in. It was still scared, but it didn't kill it. And our shad hauling mortality went from 30% to less than 1% in one year. We actually went to the extent where we were putting, you know, shaved ice in the tank to lower the water temperature, which also increased shad survival. In fact, we got to the point where we were not using fresh water at all. We were sucking seawater on our trip down, basically tankering water and using seawater as well. And all of those things aided in the survival of the broodstock shad. In fact, we got so good at the hatchery that mortality rates at the hatchery amongst adults became very, very low. The biggest source of mortality in the hatchery system was the adults chasing each other around the tank, losing their position in the tank and crashing headlong into the wall at 15 miles an hour, which usually proved fatal. So five hours down to Holyoke, the Lawrence Fishway was significantly closer, but it was still a significant long day uh, to load up with fish. We also got them from the Saco River fish lift. We also got some from the Androscoggin um, for broodstock sources. And we ran this program for quite a while. And I put this in here uh, just because it's worthy of reading about Sam. Uh, he raised oysters besides owning a shad hatchery with his family in Waldeboro, majored in geology at the University of Maine in the late 1960s and helped out at the Darling Center. One day in 1972, after a stint in the military, he decided to take a look at the new aquaculture facility that had been built for a new program to develop shellfish aquaculture in Maine. And this is him talking. I took a walk down to the building and there was this big garage door and all sorts of pipes hanging down and tanks gurgling. And here's this little guy running around, obviously very busy. He remembers the little guy was Dr. Herbert Hedu who had been hired by the university to set up a shellfish aquaculture program. Sam asked him, do you need a hand? Chapman says, Hindu, Hindu answered, yes, that tank over there isn't working right. Can you fix it for me? Chapman says he had never seen the setup before, but he recognized what the problem was. I took the whole tank apart and put it back together the way it should be and put the oysters back in, he recalls. Of all three tanks, that one ran the best. Later, Hedo asked me, what are you doing next fall? Do you need a job? And I said, sure, I've been looking for one. What do you want me to read to prepare for it? He told me, don't you read anything. I don't want you coming down here with any preconceived scientific notions. And that's how Shad, or that's how Sam got into the, to the aquaculture industry. He's a remarkable, remarkable man on so many levels because you know, the greatest scientific minds had written this stuff down and he would look at it all and say, yeah, that's good, but I think I have a better way. And he was willing to try just about anything. In fact, we became so good at culturing shed in an aquaculture facility that rather than reaching out to the federal partners to ask them for advice, they were coming to us. And Shad's, uh, Sam's son, um, Andy actually went down and assisted several hatcheries uh, in the setup, like the Waldeboro Shad Hatchery, and it increased their sex or their 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 their, their uh, success rate significantly. Uh, Sam often said, and it was actually kind of funny, 
He said, uh, the reason I'm so good at raising fish is because I was really good at killing fish. Because raising fish in captivity, anybody that's ever had a saltwater tank understands how difficult that is. Anytime you're dealing with a wild fish versus a cultured fish, it becomes more difficult yet again. And Sam excelled at all that. He really was a remarkable guy. And our shad hatchery program ended in 2009, unfortunately, because uh, we just ran out of funding. We were using principally the KHTG funding to jumpstart these shad runs and the money just ran out. And uh, it was really kind of too bad because uh, we were really getting good at it. And, and a lot of that credit goes to Sam. Those are the numbers uh, on a per year basis. And you can see there's multiple systems that we were donating to. Uh, and to just get an idea, you know, we raised about 91 million larval shad uh, in this very, very small, very, very uh, uh, Yankee ingenuity-esque shad hatchery that exceeded beyond our wildest dreams all expectations. And it really was a remarkable partnership we had there for a while. And uh, like, I can't say enough about the guy. I, I absolutely adore him. He was just a pleasure to work with. I have to put this in here because I do work for the state. And this was our, our original strategic and operational plan for restoration of shad and alewives on the Kennebec. Understand that shad used to go well up into the Sandy River system, all the way up the main stem Kennebec, and well up the Sebastopol River system, uh, uh, all the way well up into the main stem Kennebec. Kind of and maybe a little bit beyond. Um, they have an enormous range and an unfettered river system. Our objective was to achieve an annual production of six million alewives above Augusta. I think effectively, we're very close to that number now with the availability of historical habitat within the range of river herring. Uh, and an objective to achieve an annual production of 725,000 shad above Augusta. Where are we? It's a really good question. I wish I had the answer. I have no idea, but I can guarantee you the shad population in the Kennebec is in the tens upon tens of thousands. But that's all I can say, because in order to tell how many you have, we have to go back to that terrible, terrible thing called tagging. And tagging and marking and recapturing shad are, is very difficult to do. You wind up killing about as many as you tag outright, and the ones that you do tag all run off. And so it's very difficult to assess the population that way. But what we have found anecdotally is that the shad fishery, which occurs below the Lockwood facility in Waterville, is second to none. Uh, anglers go there and readily catch 20 or 30 fish in a sitting. Um, it really is a very, very good fishery. And we've seen it, and I keep contact with a lot of the fellas that fish these fish, and it's gotten better year in and year out. And also, the, remember that juvenile uh, Sane Hall survey, we're seeing those numbers tick up. Uh, and of course, we have the Penobscot coming back online. Now, the Penobscot numbers are very encouraging. For those who are unaware, the Milford fish lift is very similar to the one at Lockwood, but there's much to do about where you put the fish lift and the behavior of the fish, because this is a biologic, you have to understand that it's thinking. Okay? But if it doesn't like what it sees, it's not going to go there. And the Lockwood fish lift, while it does contact shad, and in the past it's contact, contacted quite a few, but only on the lowest of flow years, Typically speaking, Lockwood spills a lot of water. That water that's being spilled is a false attraction. The shad might come up to the fishway, but it feels all the water coming from someplace else and it goes running over there. And it doesn't utilize the fishway. Whereas Milford, there's more control, more, more hydraulic capacity. And we're seeing uh, good numbers of American shad passing Milford. I believe this past year, it was about 11,000. Um, and Lockwood was, 
a hundred and something. Um, there's a lot of shad in the Kennebec. There's a lot of shad in the Penobscot. How many, I cannot tell you. Uh, and until we get some better form of fish passage at Lockwood or something else happens, uh, we have really no way to assess the population. This is just a simple map showing the main stem Kennebec. Uh, you can see where it says Essa Runset Lake. That's about the northern extent of our uh, river herring population. Uh, over to the right of that is Great Moose Pond and Indian Pond. We're not into those systems yet. Uh, you see Unity Pond and Spastacook Lake and Plymouth Pond and Pleasant Pond. I've mentioned all those in the past. Lovejoy, Patty, China Lake, which was a, uh, a phase two, is now solidly blue for the first time in 239 years. We just completed a uh, seven year project to install fish passage in three dams and remove three dams. Uh, remarkably, it's a huge body of water, 4,000 plus acres. It should be producing a roughly a million fish per year per year uh, within the next three generations to five generations. Within the next, uh, let's say, 15 years, we should be, we should achieve that peak production, that stable production from China Lake. Really remarkable and a, and a shout out to Main Rivers. Uh, we worked extensively on this project together um, to, to get this project done. Um, and it, and it, when I first started working on China Lake, and I have to say this because it gives you an idea of the amount of, I had hair back then. I started in, in the year 2000, uh, the year after we breached Edwards Dam, and I started doing public outreach and education and advocacy, which is one of the most powerful tools in the bucket of restoration, besides lots and lots of money. Uh, and I was told by the China Lake Association at the time to go pound sand and never come back. And that's a hard thing to take, but you go back. And you go back again and again and again. And well, 22 years later, here we are, and we're back in. And, uh, and that gives you an idea of the time span and commitment that's required to work on these restoration projects, whether you're some guy from the state like me under some official cap or an outside or a public or an NGO advocate. And those are equally as important, if not more important, than what I do. If nobody advocates for these fish, then you lose them. And they are very important. We're going to get into that. I have this definition in here, and I'm sorry for the wordage, but there you have it. This is the definition of the word ecology. Uh, it comes from the Greek oikos and logos. Oikos, you know that that uh, that Greek yogurt that you can get at the store, you know, uh, it means house. It means basically the study of the house. And I'm going to read it. It's a branch of biology which studies the interactions among organisms and their environment. Sounds simple, right? Objects of study include interactions of organisms with each other and abiotic components and of their environment, of their environment. Topics in, in, of interest include biodiversity, distribution, biomass, populations of organisms, cooperation, competition within the species. Ecosystems are dynamically interacting systems of organisms and communities they make up and the non-living components of their environment. There's a lot to this. When I first looked up this uh, definition, the word pedogenesis kind of stopped me in my tracks. I didn't even, I had never heard that word before in my life. I had to look it up and it means dirt formation, the formation of dirt which is, you're all aware, without dirt, you're pretty much done, kind of uh, as important as water. Nutrient cycling and niche construction regulate the flux of energy and matter through the environment. These processes are sustained by organisms with specific life history traits. Biodiversity means the variety of species, genes, and ecosystems enhances certain ecosystem services. That's a mouthful. And that was my principal study. I'm an ecologist. That's what I went to school for. 
And these are keystone species. I'll read it. A keystone species is a species that has a disproportionately large effect on its environment relative to its abundance. Such species are described as playing a critical role in maintaining the structure of an ecological community, affecting many other organisms in an ecosystem and helping to determine the types and numbers of various other species in the community. A keystone species is a plant or animal that plays a unique and crucial role in the way an ecosystem functions. Without keystone species, the ecosystem would be dramatically different or cease to exist altogether. Notice how the cease to exist altogether part is really big. Okay. The take home here is the ecosystem is everything that you know or ever will know. And if you mess with it and you break a part of it, you might not get it back. I put this in here. This is the last bit, I swear to God, of a whole bunch of words. Shifting baseline. This is a relatively uh, new phenomena. And basically, it's a human construct where we think that what we see before us now is as good as it's ever been. And we see it get applied to fisheries, where, you know, after we came back from World War II and we perfected the diesel engine, we no longer had to rely on sail power and the vagaries of the trade winds to get out to the fishing grounds to fish, and we had diesel power, and sonar had been invented, and all of a sudden the catches went through the roof. Pelagic species, ground fish, okay? We got much, much better at fishing, okay? The hauls were enormous, okay? Eclipsing in, you know, on per vessel basis, many of the, you know, the fleet boats back in the, in the uh, early uh, 19th century. So obviously there was just an inexhaustible supply of fish there. And post-World War II, we used to go from an inexhaustible supply of fish to exhaust it in about 70 years. But we thought back, you know, post World War II, that there were plenty of fish out there. And what we, that whole shifting baseline, the whole thought that this is as good as it's ever been, uh, is kind of a death trap, really. You have to go fully back in time to understand how vast these resources were in the case of river herring, in the case of shad, in the case of smelt, cod all of this stuff. I put this in here and it works for school kids and it works for adults too, of a very, 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 very simple ecosystem, okay? That's an early series 747, it's a 400, I believe. It has Rolls-Royce engines, seven and a half million parts, 200 miles of wire, 80,000 pounds of fuel at 30,000 feet at 540 knots and it's taking you to Japan. It has one purpose, to get you there, okay? What's the most important part? You have to look at ecosystems that way. Is it the pilot? Is it the engines? Is it the fuel, okay? How many parts can you mess with before it doesn't make it? How important is the lavatory, the seats, the declining baseline? What if you got on the plane and there were no seats? You just had to sit on the floor, and that was normal, okay? Very simple ecosystem. A human being given enough time can study this and be able to review every drawing of every part ever produced put on that airplane. But with a natural ecosystem, we've only just started touching the tip of the iceberg. We've only just started studying ecosystem function in a realistic fashion in the past 60 years. You can only understand it by studying it Here's another simple ecosystem, a far simpler ecosystem. You're not gonna think so, but it is because its function is so rarefied. That's a crew of 12, 200 miles above the surface of the earth. It's a hundred yards long, cost $150 billion before it got off the ground. And it weighs 925,000 pounds. It's totally reliant on that little blue orb down below it. And it is indeed a simple ecosystem. When we look at 
natural ecosystems, the more you start trying to tease it apart, the more complex you realize it is and how interconnected it all is. This is part of the Kennebec River ecosystem. These are our diadromous species. I only have 10 of them here because frankly, the Atlantic sturgeon was too big to fit on the page. And the, the, uh, the sea run brook trout is a player in this, but it certainly isn't kind of a critical, it's more of a canary species for water quality. Although we like to fish for it an awful lot. But you can see the American shad in the upper right and the blueback and the alewife down below the striped bass and the Atlantic salmon and the eel and the smelt and the lamprey, which everybody freaks out about, but really is an incredibly important creature to have in this system. And the frost fish or the tom cod. They all co-evolved over 10,000, 15,000 years in these river systems. And they came to a balance, which we have managed to upset greatly. This next slide, I'm gonna take you through, basically call it what you will, it's essentially a food web. And it kind of gives you an idea of how complex these systems can be. So here we go. That's phytoplankton. That's zooplankton, which eats phytoplankton. Then alewife, which zooplankton, which eats plankton. These kind of show who's beaten up on who, the arrows. And now we're gonna move right along. There's an osprey and there's a great blue heron, there's an eagle, they all eat alewives. In fact, when we passed the Endangered Species Act in 1973, there were 26 nesting pairs of eagles. Strangely enough, they all occurred on a river herring, an alewife river. Every last one of them, 52 birds. That's what we had left in 1973. Ed, who hosts this meeting, actually did a flush count up on the Sebastopol below Benton Falls, where I spend a, a great deal of my time in the springtime. This past spring, in 2021, he did a flush count, and it was over 300 adult bald eagles, all within about 8, 10, 12 miles of one another, all off of that resource. By the way, the Sebastopol, since I haven't mentioned it, uh, is essentially the largest river herring run in the world. And that ain't half bad considering we started out with 100,000 broodstock per year per year. Now we're gonna move right along, showing how one of these food webs can spread out. And everybody gets in on it. including the whale, which also happens to eat. This is a humpback whale and will gladly gobble down tons of bale wives and bluebacks at the same time if they can find them. Phosphorus is the prime driver in these systems in the freshwater environment. It also bears saying that when these river herring runs occur, including the American shad, they bring in a lot of marine derived nutrients and create a very unique set of circumstances for the availability of these nutrients within the freshwater system. And inversely, they bring a lot of freshwater nutrients to the ocean when they return. But understand that these are principally a marine fish, but they are obligate freshwater spawners. Back to the whale. This is part of the problem and one of the principal parts of the problem. These are the dams in Maine. The vast bulk of these dams have no form of fish passage whatsoever. The vast bulk of these dams do not even produce hydroelectric power. The vast bulk of these dams are a relic of the industrial age. Many of them remain because of our desire to have a bigger pond, a deeper pond, more water in our pond. Okay. The vast bulk of them provide no form of fish passage whatsoever, and they block off. And you can see, you know, as we colonized, we started from the coast and moved in. We started on the smaller streams and got better and did the bigger streams, and finally the big main stem rivers. And over time, 
the resources, these river herring and shad and everything else that relied on them, remember all the other stuff that relied on them, slowly began drying up. And it went faster and faster and faster. Once we started using the rivers, the main stem rivers, there's basically a giant septic line for industrial waste and municipal discharge. I'll get back to the dam photograph here. There you have it. There's another map that shows culverts in Maine. If you thought the yellow dots were bad, you should see the culverts. It's pretty epic how chopped up we've made it as far as freshwater ecosystems and the transition to the saltwater. We've managed to fragment a good deal of the historical habitat. Uh, and we're working desperately now to unfragment as much as we can to get it plugged back in. Ideally, we'd get it all plugged back in. The take home, the root cause of decline. That's us. The root cause of restoration. That's us. Impediments to restoration. I bet you, you can guess. That's us. Okay. Literally, we're our own worst enemy when it comes to this stuff. These are the returns. They don't go all the way up to present. That was the peak year in 2008 at 5.57 million river herring passing the Benton Falls facility. It was remarkable. Interestingly, if you're ever passing through around about the month of May, mid-May, swing on in. You think you've seen a bunch of fish, swing on in, and you'll see more fish than most people will ever see in a lifetime. On a peak day, we can pass through a quarter million in about a 10-hour period. Here's one of those eastern water snakes. That's an adult alewife it's eating. And it also happens to be a very large snake. But they do eat them and they'll readily chase them down when they can. And I have to throw this in here. By the way, the previous picture was taken by a fellow who used to be on our crew, Toby Bonnie, Maine through the lens. You can look him up online. Really nice guy, excellent with the camera, very, very patient, uh, spent half an hour just getting close enough with his telephoto so he could get that shot while the snake struggled to choke down that alloy. And it did. Uh, and he also got this picture of a uh, harbor seal up at Benton Falls, roughly 70 miles from the ocean. Harbor seal 70 miles from the ocean. The last time that happened, George Washington was president. That's a long way from the ocean, but they'll follow that resource well up. So if it's there, they'll chase it. And just to give you an idea of the peril of this job, this is one of our stocking trucks. As you can see, it backed into the water a little bit too far. The fellow standing on the dock was in it when it went completely out of sight underwater. Uh, and he managed to unscramble and get out of his seatbelt and get the door open and roll down his window. And if you can imagine, there was no small amount of panic there. And here it is coming out. And I'll just run through a bunch of flash slides here of stuff that eats alewives. You ready to keep up? Here we go. River herring, leaf chad too, all these animals. And that's just the big stuff. We haven't even talked about the you know, invertebrates that'll eat alewives. Um, well, what do you think? How did I do? <laughs> I, think, I think you did really well, Nate. <laughs> my, my question is if you, can, if you can put that much water in a stocking truck, how come it can only carry 175 shad? Ah, well, that's a very good question. And here's the answer for that. Oops. There's kind of a critical mass thing that goes on uh, to give folks an idea in a thousand gallon tank uh, with favorable water conditions. We can carry about 1500 river herring. Uh, and we can hold them 
for quite a long time. But what we found with shad was if you start exceeding so many per gallon, literally that's you know more than one river herring per gallon of water when we haul river herring, but when we haul shad, they need more. And what will happen is they'll start panicking each other and they'll all drive each other into a corner. And when a shad sprints that they're remarkably fast and they hit the side of the tank, you'll actually hear them outside the truck thump into the side of the tank. And I can guarantee you that shad doesn't survive that. And if you put them in too heavy, they'll panic in mass. So that's why we dropped it down to that 175 fish maximum. It seemed to alleviate that panic mode that it would occur was the shad comes out of a natural environment and basically goes into a pitch black tank. And we mess with lighting, uh, interior lighting of the tank. We did just about everything we could think of to help them survive. It was very, very frustrating initially because we killed so many and, you know, it seems you can understand our frustration that they're, we're killing them when the very thing we're trying to do is keep them alive um, and yeah. make more of them. And yeah, I, I think you, you, well, you, guys are, you guys are heroes for doing that work. And I think that most people have absolutely no idea of all the TLC and all the time and effort and knowledge that goes into restoring a fishery like, like Shad. Or yeah. Any, you know. Hey, we have a question uh, from Greg here. He's unmuted. You want to ask a question, Greg? Go ahead. Good evening, Nate. This is Greg. Hi, Greg. Uh, I'd like to have an update on the Eastern, the Cathans, and the Abitagasset. I know shad go in them. Yeah. I don't know many people who think about them. And I kind of wonder when you were mentioned when Edwards was in, whether some of that population was relying on those lower rivers to be able to be sitting below Edwards because obviously they couldn't get up since 1837 right. to 1999. Right, and uh, you're absolutely right, Craig. And one of the things that we did prior to the removal of Edwards Dam, I had about a six year window where we went out and we gill netted extensively. Uh, we did the Abbey, we did the Cat Ants, we did the Eastern. Uh, and what's really remarkable about this, you know, anybody who's actually ever run a gill net will tell you they're a handful. Uh, to run and what you find out about running gill nets when it's pitch black out is that they're extraordinarily frightening to run uh, because that's when you run a gill net for shad uh, typically speaking you do it in the dark and we do a tailing gill net uh, where we're running parallel with the, or, or uh, uh, parallel with the current uh, because stringing them perpendicular with the current we're relying on the shad to do that that curvilinear thing when they're spawning. And we did contact them in the Eastern River. There was a known fishery there. Uh, we did contact, contact them in the uh, cat ants. We contacted a couple at the mouth of the Abbey, uh, but that water was very difficult to fish. We were running experimental gill nets. What I can tell you now about we know that shad go in there every once in a while. We'll get them in our beach seine uh, because we beach seine the mouth of the abbey. We beach seine the cat ants uh, right up into Bodenham. And we also beach seine the eastern. We do contact shad there. Typically speaking, it's throughout the beach seining cycle, uh, which runs from about the end of June right up until October, the end of October. And so we know we're getting some juvenile production out of there, but we just, we're not. We do not know the number of adults that are utilizing uh, the habitat. Uh, we also have some evidence that there's a great deal of shad that approach the Brunswick Fishway. And on some years, we get some up to the top or, uh, you know, a couple few hundred. Uh, I can't remember what the peak year was. Uh, but they really don't like going in that fishway. So we know they go into the Eastern, we know they're going into the Abbey, we know they're going into the cat ants, but I can't tell you how many. I just don't know the answer. Um, okay, uh, one other question is, when do you think the shad drop out of the Kennebec completely? Do you think it's in October or November? I think it varies from year to year, depending on 
water temperature. And I think uh, we, we're, you know, we, we all hear the word climate change, it is getting warmer, which increases the duration of internal production of these systems. It's also very flow dependent. We get great big flows in the fall, the chances are that those fish are gonna flush out of the system that much faster. Typically speaking, those huge flow events, uh, it seems counterintuitive, but actually decreases production and can trigger a response for the fish to leave, to get out in, in mass. And if we don't see those, those fall freshets, like a small hurricane or a sub-hurricane, tropical depression coming up, the fish hang out longer. And we'll contact them right up to the end of when we typically stop beach sailing, which is right about the beginning of November, uh, which is, for those of you who don't know, could be pretty uncomfortable out there in November. Um, but we do go, we beach sane the full cycle. It's typically we do 120 sanes on the lower Kennebec, uh, two weeks apart. We do the same sites on the, at the same stage of tide. Um, and we're using that as our juvenile abundance index, which I can tell you because I just ran the math on it. I'm, I'm now in charge of the compliance report. Uh, the juvenile abundance index uh, geometric mean is roughly, let me calculate in my head, uh, seven times higher than it was in uh, 2020 or 2021. Now understand that beach shaning is kind of a hit or miss dartboard kind of thing. They're either there or they're not there. But with a long-term trend with multiple, multiple years, we've been beach chaining the main stem Kennebec for the past, well, since I started and a little bit before, about 33 years, I think. Um, we are seeing a significant uptick. Uh, we certainly saw one uh, commensurate with the shad operation down in Waldeboro when we were stocking all those larval shad, our juvenile abundance index indexes went up significantly. And then they started going back down when we ceased shad hatchery operation and now they're starting to go back up. Uh, and we think there's a lot to do with the critical mass of shad. Um, and you kind of have to get over the hump to really start seeing it roll along much like an alewife pond as you're well aware, Greg, you know, you start out with six you know, fish per acre. That certainly isn't saturation. Your recruitment is better on a per female basis, not that 0.00002 but you might get 30 or 40 juveniles per female. Um, it, with shad, it's a little bit different. And there's a lot to do with how the river behaves throughout the season that, you know, that remember that abiotic factor thing in the, in the ecological definition? Uh, you have a big, big freshet, you know, in, I'll, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example, because I know this is true. You have a group of shad that are up there spawning. And it's a great, great big group. And you get, you know, 30, 40 million eggs in the water and they start drifting down the river and they start hatching out. And then a big rain event comes and it's a big cold rain event. It will kill every last one of those shad larvae. There's a reason they spread out their spawning over a great deal of time. Uh, it's not something they think about. It's how they're built. And it's not to put all your eggs in one basket in the form of a single spawning event where you're one and done and you're out of there. It takes probably two to three weeks of nightly spawning event for a female to exhaust her egg supply and she'll return to the ocean. And since I'm on that subject, and it's such a killer question, what we've found, and we're really, we haven't really 100% proven it yet, we think that the shad will spawn, the river temperature will get pretty tall outside the range that shad would typically enjoy spawning at, which is usually around, oh, 68 degrees Fahrenheit, 20 degrees Celsius. The river will start to exceed that temperature and get up around the 23, 24 degrees Celsius marks. The shad will stop spawning and drop out. And then they come back. And we started catching shad larvae, which we knew were about 14 days old because we did, well, 91 million worth of larval shad uh, hauling out of the shad hatchery. And we're pretty good at identifying even very small shad. We were catching larval shad in mid-September on the main stem Kennebec that were 14 days old, which indicated to us that they had been spawned at some point prior to that, about two weeks, late August. 
But the one thing we couldn't do is we couldn't put our fingers on the adults, but we knew they were shad larvae. And there's no way in hell a shad larvae is going to stay that small for 10 weeks. So we think there's two two potential spawning events, one that happens you know, in June, and then another one that might be smaller that happens in August. And what we also found out through historical research is the shad in the Kennebec came in sometimes extraordinarily early. They were in this time of year, before, late March, they would come in. And they'd be contacted, and we're kind of aware of that now contemporarily because of the shad fishery that occurs on the Cobbacy. That warm water coming out of the Cobbacy is warmer than everything else around it, and the shad hang out in it. And uh, kind of getting ready to go up when the spawning, the main stem temperatures do get warm enough, because they certainly don't swim up the Cobbacy, or at least not very far that I'm aware. Um, there's so much more that we don't know about shad than what we do know about shad. Uh, but we're learning something, even something very small can have much larger implications further down the road as we come to understand the species better and better. What's odd about the Cobbacy is if one or two things happen, if the dam at New Mills slows down the flow, they leave. Yep. If the flow stays the same and they're happy and then the temperature warms up in the main stem, they leave. Yeah, And what's interesting is they don't really kind of sit in the old sites like we'll say at Six Mile or Edwards or whatever. They go straight to Waterville. Yeah, boom. Nonstop. It's, it's yep. really remarkable. My friends, as you know, I know the crowd that fishes for these things. And it's, you know, they're catching them one day in Carbacy and the next day they're in Waterville and there's nobody in Carbacy catching anything. It's like mass migration. Right. And they... they there's such a level of mystery about it. I, I, I've spent several nights sitting on the bank at Taconic Bay, just watching and watching these, these spawning schools of shad come right up to the shore and then sprint away again and again and again and again, they do it. Uh, and of course, you know, hearing from that core group of fishermen up there, catching those fish and how rapidly that occurs after no more fish are, are uh, available at Coppicey. They really do go running right up there. Some of them will stop around Six Mile Island and run those crib works for a while. Um, yep. We see that. Uh, some of them up at Naguamke, they'll they'll hang out there for a little bit. They're, they're very kind of particular where they spawn and they like that that Taconic Bay an awful lot, other than the fact that there's a whole bunch of river above them, but they just can't get to it effectively right now because of the way the fish passage behaves there. Hey, Nate, this is this is Ed. I think that um, we're about 20 minutes past eight. Okay. And, and, and I think that we want to, you can give folks a contact. If I, if I can share my screen, I actually put your email address on a slide. Yeah, have at it. If you want. Uh, um, Feel free yeah, no. to send me a question. Uh, uh, you know, typically speaking, I answer. So, so, so th that's how you get a hold of Nate there, right? And and I, I think normally, you know, you keep going. People are fading away. So, um, uh, but I, Martha wants to probably wrap things up. I think, and and other people want to move on. So, yeah, is this the best way to get you, Nate? Yep, it really is. I uh, typically check my email every day. So. Okay. So pretty simple, nate.gray at main.gov, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, so I think, thanks, Nate. This is wonderful. And uh, I want to thank everybody for coming as well. It's a great evening. And remember that if you have friends that didn't watch this or listen and want to hear it, it is recorded. And uh, you can access it off our website, the homepage down the education column on the right. Thank you. Thank hey, you. thanks for having me. And thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks, Nate. Really enjoyed it. Night, all. Night.